Hi, everyone. Welcome to the podcast. And we have welcome back a good friend and trusted advocate, Mr. Dave Champion, who has been gracious enough to join us for a part two of Common Law Trusts. Uh, we know it's a deeply involved and engrossed subject matter. So sometimes it takes a few times to absorb the information like other things we've talked about with the, in the financial world. Uh, this is its own animal. And so it, it does need a little bit of uh, redressing. And so Dave has been gracious enough to join us for a part two on the subject where we'll cover some of the same questions and dive into some other questions just to have fun with him and challenge his knowledge base, which we know he will satisfy. So we look forward to seeing his answers there. If you are new to the podcast, please do like, subscribe, and share, and hit that notification bell so you don't miss a moment of the updates. Mr. Champion, welcome back to the podcast. How are you doing good, sir? I'm great, John. Thank you for having me again. Oh, it's always a pleasure, brother. I've, I've enjoyed our burgeoning friendship as well. So, um, okay, so I'm going to hit you right off the top. So I know you are, are definitely always ready for a challenge. And I don't think this will pose much for you and your audience, but here we go nonetheless. Um, one of the questions that I was thinking about in our last discussion for trust is, and, and I apologize if, it, if it's a dumb question, but it's one that it was just a curiosity thing. If we have a common law trust, do we need to even have a will? No. Okay. No. <clears throat> that's not to say you cannot have a will. Sure. Um, and, and I think a, a more full-throated answer would be it depends on how complex one's financial arrangements are. Um, so you can, a person might, let's say somebody has a lot of financial irons in the fire. So they may choose to have some of them in, in this trust and some of them in that trust. And then they may choose to have certain assets that are simply privately owned in their own name. Okay. Yep. Um, so uh, what I see fairly commonly is that somebody who has more or less complex financial arrangements, the big money's in the trust. But then there's always personal property. Um, th there's things that the person doesn't see a need to place into trust. So the person may have a quantity of gold and silver at home in their safe. Mm -hmm. uh, they may have a firearms collection. Um, they may have other collectibles um, that are of some value that they keep in the home. Uh, they may have you know, hundreds of thousands of beautiful pieces of furniture and whatnot in, in, in a very expensive home that they didn't put into trust, right? So a will is perfectly suited for that. And of course, as you well know, if one puts it puts those kind of things in a living will, then there's no probate. Hmm. Good to know. Okay, thank you for that. That just wanted to make sure um, we uncovered all aspects of this. Didn't leave any stone unturned. Um, it's said that a common law trust is a private irrevocable express express trust, but not all private irrevocable express trusts are, as you know, common law trusts. So, with that in mind, is a common law trust the same as an unincorporated business organization and or peer trust organization? Um, the first two, yes. A common law trust is the same thing as an unincorporated business entity. Uh, let me rephrase that. It, it is one flavor of an unincorporated business en entity. Okay, there, there are other unincorporated business entities. Um, what was the, the, the third one? Uh, and or a pure trust organization. Okay, not, not all trusts are pure. Um, pure has its own definition. Mm -hmm. um, however... The distinction between pure and not using the word pure is generally irrelevant. Uh, the, uh, pure, what it really does is it's, it adds yet another descriptor for most common law trusts. Um, but for instance, if somebody were to acquire a common law trust and it did not say in the title or it did not say in the opening part of the indenture that it's pure. <laughs> it still may be pure by the elements of the trust. Right. Um, and <clears throat> I believe, people can disagree with me, but I believe pure is, if the trust is structured correctly, whether or not the word pure appears is irrelevant. It's okay. like I said, it's, it's Yeah. Yeah, it's just a almost a misnomer, maybe to some extent. To some extent, yes. Okay. Yeah, it got it got real big in the '90s that that adding that word in, and I'm not sure why. Hmm. Okay. Good to know. Thank you. 
Um, a trustee knows how to manage the trust, but may not be an expert in managing the assets of the trust for the benefit of it, such as beneficiaries. If the trustee is allowed to bring in experts to manage, like we were talking about before, having a manager as, a, as an option, to manage the assets of the trust, such as precious metals, like you mentioned, uh, you know, real estate, property, stocks, bonds, et cetera, according to the trust indenture. So um, even though a trustee is contracted to be a fiduciary of the trust, what protects a trust from a trustee operating in bad faith? Primarily the protector. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so I think we discussed this a bit during my first visit with you to discuss trust. Right. I, I always advocate <laughs> that when a person is considering doing a common law trust, that they appoint as the trustee a completely independent professional trustee. Okay. Um, what's very common in the liberty movement is, oh, I'm going to have my brother John do it, or I'm going to have you know my, my aunt Sissy do it, um, because I trust them. Okay. Mm -hmm. And that's great. Trust is a beautiful thing. But trust does not take the place of experience, competency, and knowledge. Okay. And that's what a professional trustee brings to the table are, the, are those elements. Um, the professional trustee's job, job one, remember there used to be four, job one quality, right? Okay, that was the slogan. Okay, so job one for a trustee is to protect the integrity of the trust because a trust can literally conduct itself in such a way that it invalidates its status as a trust. Mm -hmm. So the primary role of a trustee is to have the knowledge, background, experience, and aptitude to make sure that the trust stays on the straight and narrow in terms of trust law. Now, on to your specific question about, man I'm going to call it, instead of managing the assets, I'm going to call it managing the business, okay? Um, because it doesn't really matter whether it's um, investing in precious metals or whether it's running a roofing company for, for profit. There's, you're still trying to enlarge the corpus of the trust, right? Um, so in that case, what you would want to do with it is bring in a managing agent. Now, that's specified in the indenture of the trust. If it's not in there, number one, you can't do it. Number two, it's a bad trust. <laughs> so you want to bring in a managing agent. The managing agent has authority to run the business in which the trust is engaged, okay? He, he or she has no control over the trust per se. They are brought in solely to operate the business. In that regard, they're somewhat like a CEO or the president of a corporation. Okay? They call the shots as far as what is, what is being done to enlarge the corpus. Now, the difference is, of course, if you're talking about uh, General Motors as an example, um, the job of the CEO is to reward the shareholders. Um, and that's a very real-time thing with the shareholders having a, a very immediate response to whether that's happening or not. Okay, mm -hmm. So in a trust, it's completely different. And what I mean by that is the managing agent, the, the underlying purpose of operating the business, whatever it is, is to enlarge the corpus of the trust for the benefit of the unit certificate holders, what in an insurance policy would be called a beneficiary. Okay, So... Ev that, that's an important thing to keep in mind when selecting a managing agent to run the business. Yes, the managing agent can receive compensation. Yes, other people engaged um, under the managing agent, because the managing agent can hire people and so forth. Um, all of them need to be, I think you would agree, fairly compensated for their time and efforts, just like we would in any venture. But ultimately, where in a corporate structure, the profits get disseminated to the shareholders, in a trust, the profits are either reinvested or they're held to enlarge the corpus of the trust for the benefit for the benefit of the unit certificate holders. Got it. Okay, thank you for that. So um, it's a different mindset. That's that's the point I really want to make. The managing agent needs to understand. <clears throat> yes, in many ways, it's similar to a CEO, but there's a pretty significant difference where it's not like a CEO. Mm -hmm. It's almost like a left brain, right brain kind of thing, in a way. There you go. Interchangeable. Um, what is the role of a trust protector? The trust protector, <clears throat> primarily, it's to, I hate to phrase it this way, to keep an eye on the trustee. Okay? Um, 
usually, excuse me, a trust indenture will preclude virtually everybody in the trust from suing the trustees. Huh. Um, mm -hmm. And the reason for that is if anybody who held any position within the trust could sue the trustee, the trustee would be paralyzed, okay? Because any given day, any week, any month, he could be sued for anything he did. Okay. Another good reason to hire a professional. So we don't have to go down this road. Aunt, Aunt Mary right. may not understand what she's doing, right? Okay, right. so I also advocate that people select somebody, also an independent professional, as the protector. And here's why. There are two kinds of inappropriate conduct that, that a trustee can engage in. One is simply making an error, okay. uh, possibly not understanding that that particular move was in error. Okay. It does not comport itself with trust principles. It does not comport itself with indenture, so forth. The trustee can make an honest error. We all do in life. So the protector should reach out, it, when it's pointed out, the protector should reach out to the trustee and the protector should say, hey, Frank, um, we need to chat about this. Okay. Now, if it's an honest mistake, the trustee is probably going to say, holy cow, I'm sorry, you're totally right. I didn't see it from that angle. I didn't view it within that particular construct. I won't do it again. Or if it's something that needs to be cured, he's going to cure it. Okay. Um, that's number one. Number two is malicious conduct. When it's malicious conduct, uh, you sh your protector should have the skill sets, the knowledge and experience in law and trust law to be able to determine that he or she is being bullshitted by a malicious trustee. Okay. At that point, the trustee should demand, I'm sorry, the protector should demand the trustee resign. If the trustee does not resign, the protector has the authority to take the trustee to court and ask a court to remove the trustee. Now, in some indentures, this is typically, when I was in the trust game, I, just a tiny percentage of the trust that I wrote had more than a single trustee. But let's say for the sake of this illustration, there was a board of trustees and say there's there six trustees. Depending on how the indenture is written, it is possible that a majority of the trustees could remove an, a, a malicious trustee, um, but that's not common in trust law. The, the majority of trustees are not given the authority to get rid of, because the one guy may have, may have a valid concern and they just want to get rid of him so they can do their thing. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's no, normally you don't find that language in a trust indenture. Remember, this is all controlled by the indenture. Another word for the indenture is the contract, the contract that binds all the parties together in this venture that once it's all, all the parties in place, we then call it a trust, okay? Um, but normally, it is the protector's role to file an action with a court and explain to the court why this trustee is acting maliciously has violated the indenture, has violated the general principles of trust law, perhaps is engaged in some sort of self-aggrandizement. Okay? Um, and at that point, then a judge can order that trustee removed. I see. Okay. So Dave, thank you. We, um, <clears throat> so let's say somebody doesn't have a business or they want to protect, I'm just different scenarios here. If, you know, have different family members, or maybe they do have you know, uh, a personal venture and they have a business or they, they want to separate those items, right? So they don't bleed into each other. And so they want to have different trusts as a result. Therefore, is it recommended with if what you just said in mind with the trust protector, is it recommended to have a trust protector for each separate trust? So let's take a scenario where <clears throat> a gentleman decides he wants to put a lot of, he wants one trust to be what we euphemistically call a family preservation trust. He just wants to put assets there and park them, okay? In this trust over here, he's running an active daily enterprise. Okay. Um, there, prov <laughs> provided that the, when the trust is created, 
a solid professional protector is identified, there's no reason he can't be, he or she cannot be the protector on both trusts or three trusts or four trusts. Um, but uh, remember, the, the protector has no, short of a trustee doing something a trustee shouldn't be doing, the protector has zero role, okay, in a trust. So really, a protector can sign on as a protector and go for two years, 10 years, 17 years without ever becoming involved in any at all with the role of protector because the trustee or trustees are doing the right thing. Yeah. So typically the only time the protector gets involved is if somebody else within the contract reaches out to the protector and says, I question whether we have a problem here. And then the protector can review the situation and determine it. Now, I did mention professional protector, professional trustee. Okay. One of the reasons I think it's important to have a competent professional experienced protector is to minimize the chances that there's going to be a that the communication between the protector and the trustee is going to grow into something unpleasant. Okay. Um, if the protector doesn't know his or her job, the trustee that may not have acted correctly may be able to basically just run over the protector because the protector doesn't know his or her job well enough. Okay. But if a protector is truly competent, truly professional, basically somebody who, who could step in as trustee, that, that's sort of the standard, the gold standard that I think exists. Okay. Um, it's much more likely than whether it's an amiable discussion or something less than that, that faced with a truly knowledgeable protector, that, that trustee is going to take corrective action rather than be a dick. Great. That makes total sense. Thank you for being very detailed as always. <laughs> no, because I mean, no, because there's a, there's a fine line where you need to be articulate but also be succinct. And I think that you, you, you ride that line really well, you know, because thank you, you go to too much, you kind of lose people. And then they're like, well, I'm confused to what the point, you know, what the answer was and they get, you know, so you need a balance. I, I'm hoping people, your audience can return to these interviews that I do with you mm -hmm. because I, I know <clears throat> we're throwing a lot at them Yeah, in a, in a subject that they're not typically familiar with. Right. So that's one of the great things I think about this. It's like a resource. They can go back to, you know, twice, nine times, 17 times until they have it all locked in. Yeah. I mean, that's why I always encourage my audience. I'm sure you do as well. Um, Cause I, I see the comments are pretty knowledgeable and up on things, uh, but it's good to use these podcasts as an archival, right. As a resource and <clears throat> go back. And I always encourage my audience to take notes and <clears throat> rewind back. And as many times as they need, like you said, it's a great reference point. Uh, so, okay. So, you kind of touched on this earlier, so it's kind of a, a reprise question, but you were talking about certain things that you might put in a well, like antiques, jewelry, paintings, fine arts, what have you, music equipment, whatever it is of value to. But uh, that in mind, what are the primary things that you see transferred into a trust? It depends <clears throat> pretty much on how the, the person who decides, I want to create a trust. It, it really depends on what that person has in mind. Um, I have seen people over the years put everything. Like they walk around their house and shoot a video and then itemize from the video and then say, I'm putting all of this in trust. Um, yeah. I consider that a little extreme, but there's nothing wrong with doing that, to be clear. Mm -hmm. um, but generally, generally the purpose of putting something into a trust is twofold. One, to preserve it for the benef benefit of the unit certificate holders, okay? And number two, that uh, if it's an irrevocable trust, it places the activity, whatever it is, places the activity in a sphere that doesn't die, okay, it goes on in perpetuity. Mm -hmm. So um, <clears throat> let's say somebody is 75 years old and in poor health, but runs uh, a fairly 
profitable enterprise. Uh, you put that enterprise into into trust. <clears throat> so now, excuse me. <clears throat> so now, that enterprise never dies. It doesn't die when he dies. Uh, um, so there's a trustee to make sure that the structure, the container in which the, the enterprise has been placed, that remains stable. Then you have a managing agent, somebody presumptively in our uh, example that has worked for this gentleman for some time and knows and knows the business inside and out and is trusted by the owner. Mm -hmm. um, so that person becomes the managing agent. And then literally that enterprise, it, just like a corporation, that enterprise can go on for generations. It can go on for hundreds of years, always in the interest of the unit certificate holders. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I can see that. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> okay, so because of the common law trust uniqueness, what qualities do you look for in order to determine if a person would make a good common law trustee? Mm. <clears throat> so this is a tough one for me, John. Um, and the reason is, you know, I, I can count on one hand the people that I believe fulfill that role in a nation of 334 million people. I can count on one hand. And I was in that space for a very long time, and I'm still associated with the people in that space. Uh, so the, the, the qualities, and this is subjective, but I hope people will understand that it is the result of a lot of years of experience. It isn't, it isn't subjective such as, you know, I like the color blue. <laughs> um, first of all, the person who's selected should have a strong foundation in law, not necessarily trust law, law. Because as, as much as people like to throw around ideas about common law trusts, it's still a legal entity. Okay? As I said earlier, the, another word for the indenture is contract. In some trusts, it's literally written indenture and contract. The title of the, the the title of the indenture or contract and indenture. Okay. So it's the, the very nature is under contract law. So that's law, right? Um, if it ever is reviewed by court, that's law. If it is engaged in an activity that is in any way regulated, that's law. Okay. And again, the primary job one of the trustee is to maintain the integrity of the trust. So there is more to that job than simply understanding trust law. You have to understand the, if we can use the analogy, trust law is a vessel, we have to understand the ocean, <laughs> okay? So if we say that the ocean is the law and trust law is the vessel floating on it, it's one, one element on the, on, in the larger context. Uh, so then the second most important thing is that the trustee understands the principles of trust law. Yeah. which you and I have talked about a little bit before. Um, these go back hundreds of years. And when I review, people send me trusts to review. And oftentimes when I review the trust, what comes through loud and clear to me is that these unwritten principles, well, they were probably written hundreds of years ago, but, but today they're now unwritten principles. But the courts still follow and adhere to these unwritten principles. Yeah. Um, a lot, it seems that most of the people who are in the game today, they have no knowledge or awareness of those principles. Yeah. So you've got, first of all, you've got this large construct, they should be knowledgeable in the law. Second, we narrow it down, they should be knowledgeable in trust principles. Third, they should understand law and trust principles sufficient that when they review the indenture, they have a complete and full understanding, not just of the actual words that appear there, but of the duties those words impart. That Because years ago, a buddy of mine said to me, Dave, no matter how carefully you craft what comes out of your mouth, you're not in control of what the other person hears. And I said, 
that's BS, right? That was sort of an arrogant perspective on my part. I was like, I work very hard to be articulate, right? Um, and, you know, years later, I told him you were right, and I was wrong. <laughs> I am not in control of what they hear, no matter how carefully I craft what I say. Well, right. the same thing is true of trust indenture. No matter how carefully it's written, the person who is going to have to administrate that is the trustee. And so it has to be somebody, we have the, the larger construct of the law, the smaller construct of, of trust principles, and then a narrower construct of being able to not just read the words, but understand the limitations and duties that those words impose. Um, and of course, uh, undergirding all of this is integrity. And mm -hmm. that's, I, I think, where some a lot of people struggle. I, I think, <clears throat> for instance, if somebody's listening to you and I talk right now, and they're saying, okay, I, I get this, the law, trust principles, being able to properly interpret the duties and limits of the trust indenture. Okay. I think your audience will probably say, I get that. Right. And then we come to integrity. And I think that's where everybody goes, hmm, okay. And right. that's another reason I encourage people to use a professional trustee. A professional trustee typically sits as, as a trustee for hundreds of trusts and has no desire to interfere in the operation of any of those or, or aggrandize themselves with the property of the trust or anything, right? right? That's not what a professional trustee does. But, you know, Uncle Bobby, you may right. find out, you know, seven years down the road, wasn't quite as imbued with as much integrity as you imagine. Yeah, and it's, there's a certain level of impartiality, like they say in the old adage, Dave, right? Don't go into business with family, you know, for instance, as an example. Yes. Um, and, and I have to say, Dave, before we go forward, I mean, what you said about the, the narrative with your friend about you're not in control of, you know, what you craft as a message and what gets across. I mean, I go through this every day with my audience. Like, there's a good contingency to my audience that gets it, understands it and is dialed in, right? And everybody awakens, awakens at, like puberty, hits their own journey, their own process. That's understandable. But there are some people, no matter how many times they say something, they hear what they want to hear, or it doesn't jive with the candy coated that they're getting somewhere else that tickles their ears. And it's disagreeable because the facts are getting in the way of their objectivity, if you yes. will. Yes. So, okay. So I uh, just wanted to say, I totally agree with you on that point. Um, be, okay, so can a trust be limited to one and only one trustee at any given time in the life of a trust? I'm not sure I understand the question. Can you phrase it differently? I want to make so, sure I give you the correct answer. Yeah, yeah. So for the life of a trust, it's, let's just say somebody has one trust. Um, can they just have that one trustee or can they add trustees or swap them out? Not so much if there's malfeasance, if they just, somebody dies, for instance, and they need to- sure. Change, yes, most, example. most, any competent trust will have language in the trust discussing the ability to add trustees or remove trustees. Um, so, like I said, the vast majority of trusts in which I have been involved with in my life had, had a single trustee. Um, some had maybe two or three. I don't think I was ever involved in a trust that had more than three trustees ever. And we're, the, even that would probably be far less than 1% of all the trust I was involved in. So my experience is that one trustee is generally the rule. And at any time, another, if the trust is properly written, at any time, another trustee can be brought on. So let's just take a look at an example. Let's say somebody sits as a trustee for 18 years, and over that period of time, maybe they're looking at retirement from their primary occupation, um, maybe they're planning to move, uh, uh, maybe they're experiencing health problems, and they decide this trust will at least temporarily be rudderless in, in terms of maintaining the integrity. Mm -hmm. If I were to drop dead, or I was in a position where I was no longer able to uh, rigorously attend to my responsibilities. Okay. So I think we need to bring somebody else on board. And typically that involves the protector. So the trustee would reach out to the protector and the protector and the trustee would put names in the hat and then 
but they wouldn't just draw it. <laughs> they, they would discuss who who is who they both believe would be, make the best subsequent trustee. So then that trustee is brought on at that point. You have two trustees. And then if the second, if the original trustee wants to resign or anything unfortunate happens, the trust is not left rudderless. Gotcha. Thank you. But again, this is, this is all controlled by the language of the, of the indenture. Sure. Under the certain, certain premises. Absolutely. Yes. Um, okay. So if, Okay, this is going to be a little bit of a wordy question, so bear with me. But if the intent of the trust creator appears to be in conflict with what is considered to be in the best interest for the beneficiaries, can said trustees modify the trust contrary to the trust indenture? No. Okay. okay. Um, how do you keep a private, irrevocable express trust private? You can't. That, that, that whole private thing is something that's come up in like the last 15, 17 years out of, out of the blue. Mm -hmm. um, when, I, when I was in the game, <clears throat> nobody, said, nobody said it was a private trust. Um, what, what makes it, I don't even like to use the word private, but if I can, for the sake of responding specifically to your question, sure. what makes it private is that it's not registered anywhere. Okay, so like a corporation is registered with the Secretary of the State in which it was created. Um, uh, other forms of business entities are registered. Uh, even a sole proprietorship, if they, you, if if Bob Jones uses a name for his enterprise other than Bob Jones, he has to take out a DBA, right? Uh, right. Uh, yeah, and then that is that becomes a matter of government record for some actual good reasons. But the point is none of that exists with a common law trust. It's registered nowhere. Now, if the trust is a family preservation trust, that, that's its sole function. Um, it, it can probably remain private in perpetuity. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. In other words, and by private, what I mean is, <clears throat> excuse me, nobody knows it exists, okay? Except for the participants. Right. However, if it's a business trust and it's out in the marketplace okay, and it gets sued, the idea that somehow it's, I, I don't even know what it means, private, <laughs> it is, I, I don't know what people think they mean when they say private. Um, it's not, it still would not be registered. I should be clear about that. Okay, if somebody takes the, 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 the business to court, but the business is actually contained within the corpus of the trust. Okay, they're literally taking the trust to court. Okay, so the and somebody suggested to me a, a while back that because it's a private trust, they wouldn't have to appear in court even if they were sued. And I'm like, so that's not how the world works. Um, that's not going to happen. Somebody is going to go to jail if, if somebody tries that. Um, whether it's the managing agent, whether it's the trustee, somebody's going to jail if they are properly served and they don't show up in court. Um, <clears throat> so I would encourage people <clears throat> not to get wrapped around the axle over the word private, especially in the light of the fact that, you know, if you go back to say that the era of the founding fathers, no, nobody referred to a common law, well, first of all, nobody referred to them as common law trusts. They were just referred to as trusts. <laughs> right. Okay. So, no, yeah, it's like, you know, what are, what are they called? Brazil nuts in Brazil, right? Nuts. <laughs> yeah. So the founding fathers would have called what we now call a common law trust because we want to distinguish it from a statutory trust. They just called it trust. And the founding fathers would not have called it a private trust because a common law trust is in its nature, again, I hate the word private, only in the sense that it's not registered anywhere with the government. So... But I think a lot of people who hear that believe there's other aspects that this private has a much broader implication. There's something truly powerful and sexy about the word private being associated with their trust. There isn't. I think maybe a better word is undisclosed. Since you yes. You haven't yes. Yes. unregistered, but yeah. Just yeah. wanted to get your take on that. Thank you. Um, what is the difference between, <clears throat> excuse me, a beneficiary and a holder of beneficiary interest certificates? So beneficiary is not a term used in trust law. Okay? 
that's why earlier <clears throat> when I referred to the unit certificate holder, I said, which would be somewhat similar to a beneficiary and insurance policy. Yeah. Uh, we use the term, term beneficiary insurance policies, but we use unit certificate holders in the trust world. Now, the unit certificate holders, and this is perhaps where people get their words crossed up a little bit, mm -hmm. unit certificate holders possess a beneficial interest. Okay. Uh, however, they cannot act on that beneficial interest like a shareholder can. You, you, we all have seen the stories where a group of shareholders have sued the company or they've sued the CEO over something. Okay. Um, and, and that's because they have a beneficial interest they, it, with beneficial is just a different way of saying a financial interest. Okay. They, although a beneficial interest can transcend financial interest, it usually means financial interest. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, but where shareholders can sue a corporation or sue the CEO, um, the unit certificate holders, despite having a beneficial interest in the corpus, they cannot sue the trust and they cannot sue the trustee. Okay. So maybe yeah. maybe the fact that they have a beneficial interest mm -hmm. is how some people cross up that language and call them the beneficiaries. But the correct term in trust law is unit certificate holder. Unit certificate holder. It's almost like a layer of insulation or protection, it sounds like, the way you describe it. Well, just because, you know, just having, like having different, you know, if you had multiple trustees or you have unit certificate holders, it, it breaks it up and, you know, kind of, it, it's not all tied to one person. Yes, correct. Well, maybe. Um, because, Potentially. Th yeah, there are, every trust I've ever looked at has had 100 units. Mm -hmm. And those units can be distributed in any way that the person who says, hey, I want to create a trust, this is how I want things to go, right? Right. Um, th he can give 99 of those units to one person and one to another or 50, 50, 60, 40, 70, whatever. Right. Sure, sure. Um, so you could literally have, if, you know, 10 people each having 10 units. Right. So just, or, just to be clear there, there can be multiple people with beneficial, with a beneficial interest in the corpus. Or, 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 or 20 people with five, 5% in each or whatever. It, yes. Yeah. Yes. So, okay, great. Thank you for that. Uh, what is the difference between a grantor and an exchanger? Exchanger is a term that seems to have become more popularized in like the last 20 years. Um, it, it, so have you heard the phrase, a, a grantor's trust? I have. Okay. That's an irrevocable trust. Okay. So the grantor, what was that old song from like when we were kids? You put your right hand in, you take oh, the your right hand out. The hokey pokey. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So when you have an irrevocable trust, it's kind of like that. I put my property in, I shake it all around, I take my property <laughs> out. Okay. Um, and there's very little protection um, as far as liability, things like that, right? Um and then you have an irrevocable trust where you put it in and that's that. You don't get to change your mind down the road. It's not the hokey pokey trust. Okay. okay. So, um, <laughs> when I go back to the early 90s in trust law, the, the term that was used for the person who was who said, I, I, I think it's nifty to create a trust, I want to do that, and placed whatever property he thought right into trust, the term was settler. Okay. Um, and, of course, settler has a long and distinguished uh, role in the language of trust principles. But I noticed about uh, 17, 18, 20 years ago, exchanger seemed to come around. Um, I'm not keen on exchanger. By, by the way, I'm not saying there's any huge legal distinction. Let me be clear about that. Mm -hmm. But for instance, if we talk about things like compensation for labor, okay, there's an exchange of equal value. Let's say you want a ditch dug and I tell you I'll do it for $500. Okay. At the end of the day, you give me $500 you have a ditch you valued at $500. Mm -hmm. So it's an exchange, okay? 
But that's not what happens in a trust. It's it's not <laughs> reciprocal. Okay. Right. You say, I own this piece of real property. I'm signing it over to the trust. Boom, done. That's why I'm not keen on the word exchanger. And I don't know how a modern court would view that word. Mm. But for me, and this is this, many of the things we've discussed so far, John, are, are fairly critical. They're important parts. This yeah. I don't think is, is critical. But sure. I, I would just use the word settler. No, I just want to drill down on all, because this is a, a second like a part two video. So I wanted to drill down all, all the little specifics somebody might ask just so as they go back to review it, they could say, oh, this correlates to this or that covers that. And I hadn't thought about that subject, but I'm glad it was addressed, you know? Yes, and, absolutely. Uh, to, just to piggyback off just for fun before the next question, because we've got to know each other a little bit. <laughs> Your hokey pokey example. If you had people that got married and unmarried and remarried to the same person, you could, you could put your ex-wife in, you put your ex wife in. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Bro, who did that? Don Johnson with Melody Griffith. Married or divorced or married oh, yeah. or again. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. divorced her again. Yeah. yeah. You, should, you should get this kind of a trust. <laughs> right. Um, okay. So and that's an exchanger. Yeah. Yeah. No, well, it's a whole other story there. Um, maybe sounds like a fairly simplistic question, but again, just want to cover all the bases. How do you maintain a trust over generations? The trust remains the same over time. Okay. So obviously humans don't. Right. So we talked a little bit about the process of, um, for the sake of this question, we'll say revitalizing the trustees. Okay. So you've got a trustee that started when he was 42 and now he's 72. You might want to consider bringing one or more additional trustees in. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now you got the unit certificate holders. Now, because now some trusts have a dissolution date. It's written right in the indenture. Okay. So 33 years from the day this trust goes into effect, this trust shall cease to exist and the corpus of the trust shall be distributed to the unit certificate holders in accordance with the percentages, blah, 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 blah. Right. Mm -hmm. Some trusts have that language. Many do, as a matter of fact. But some don't, and those are meant to exist in perpetuity. So in that case, what would happen would be the units, the beneficial interest held by the percentage of units held could literally be willed or a unit certificate holder could say, you know what? I'm 81 years old. I'm never going to get anything out of this trust. <laughs> so I would like to surrender my units back to the trust. And uh, if, if the trustees agree, well, I think my niece would be a great person to receive those units. Mm -hmm. Now, the trustees are not bound to that suggestion. Um, but normally, again, because the trustees' number one role is to preserve the integrity of the trust, as long as there's a, no reason not to do that, mm -hmm. my experience has been almost universally a, tr a trustee will say, sure, as long as it's not anything that's violative of the principles of the trust, sure, we'll go ahead and reassign it to the person you would like it reassigned to. Got it. But because units represent beneficial interest, they can be willed unless the indenture says otherwise. Now, when, let's say, a unit certificate holder wills his units, his beneficial interest represented by the units, to his daughter, okay? Yeah. The daughter needs to inform the trustee of that, or even better, the unit certificate holder would inform the trustee of his intentions. So... When the unit certificate holder passes away and beneficial interests uh, are willed to the daughter, then the managing agent, I'm sorry, the trustee has to send out documents to the daughter, having the daughter formally accept those units. Because the operation of the will is a separate matter from the operation of the trust. Mm. So... If the unit certificate holder were, were to will that beneficial interest to the daughter and the daughter were to say, 
I hated my dad. I don't want anything to do with this. Okay. Hmm. Unless she were to sign on the dotted line that she accepts those units from the managing agent, then those units would have to be assigned elsewhere at the discretion of the trustee. Okay. Okay. Thank you. And, and see, what we're talking about here, John, mm -hmm. is where we get into the principles of trust law, which are unwritten, and generally the kind of scenario we just discussed, you won't find in the indenture. It's too obscure. Which, if you think about it, Dave, at least to my mind, goes back to what you talked about earlier with a criteria that you would be using to decide, you know, who would be a trustee or a trust protector integrity. Mm, correct. Plays, yes. Plays, going back and forth plays an integral role, even in this point as well, you know, in this discussion. Um, so how do you, how do you know that a trust is no longer needed or beneficial? Not sure I have a good answer for you, John, because in all my okay. years working with trusts, I've never seen anybody abandon a trust. Yeah. And um, again, the dissolution of the trust is typically controlled by the language in the indenture. So let's say the settler, that's the guy who said, I want to create a trust. Let's do this. Okay. And then the settler took his property and placed it in trust. Let's say 12 years down the road, the settler says, ah, I'm tired of this trust. I don't want to do that anymore. Give me all my shit back. I'm going to just do a living will, and that's that. Okay. So the trustee would have to look him in the face and say, no, you are breaching the contract. Hmm. This trust will continue until the dissolution date. And on the dissolution date, I will dissolve the assets of this trust and distribute them in accordance with the percentage of the units. <laughs> um, fortunately, when I sat as trustee, I never had anybody go down that road. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that the, the only circumstance that I can imagine, short of the one where I said the settler just said, oh, the hell with this. Let's, let's forget that whole trust thing, which I've never seen happen. Sure. What, what presumptively could happen is the content in accordance with the indenture the corpus could be distributed to the unit certificate holders, but the trust is not dissolved per se. So going back to the ocean and the ship <laughs> analogy, um, now it's like a ghost ship. It's just an empty vessel floating on the ocean. It serves mm -hmm. no purpose, mm -hmm. you know. Um, but that every trust indenture I've seen, at least any professional one. Um, it talks about the, if, if when it talks about the final distribution, it also says that that, that will dissolve the trust. Um, and if, if a trust indenture doesn't say that, it says the final distribution is to be done and the trust is, and, but it doesn't mention anything about dissolving the trust at that time, that probably isn't a well thought out indenture. And in that scenario, thank you. In that scenario, that person you were talking about is a hypothetical. They would have no recourse in court, right, to try to get out of the trust because it's fairly ironclad. Is that right? Are you talking about the person who says, just forget this whole trust, yeah. they give me my property? Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. He did, well, keep in mind, at that point, the property is titled in the name of the trustee. Right. So okay. if, if, for instance, you know, I was a trustee, the title would read, Title II, Dave Champion acting as trustee for XYZ Trust. That's mm -hmm. how the title would read. So if, if at, in my role as trustee, I hold title, and the contract says it's in perpetuity or there's a dissolution date, the it's, seller has no game. Yeah, the judge is going to just refer to one or the other, whatever is on, on the record. Yes, the judge is going to eventually look at the settler and say, what are you, what are you doing here? Yeah. You, you, you created this contract, right. <laughs> and the contract has terms, and now you want to violate the terms. No, I'm sorry, you can't do that. The managing, I'm sorry, the trustee will continue to serve as trustee. The trust will remain in force 
until the drop dead data that's in the indenture. Gotcha. Um, yeah, I just want to exhaust all possibilities again, just looking at this from you know every conceivable angle. Uh, so let's just go with that that rare oddity or occurrence. How is a trust, if possible, how would it be closed? Would it just be those last two things, the, the dissolution date? Would that be the only way to close it? Yes. Um, I have never, ever seen a trust indenture that didn't, for, that didn't contain provisions that talked about, <laughs> I'll use a biblical term, Sure. The end, the end days, right? Mm -hmm. um, the the last days of the trust and, and what it's going to do, mm -hmm. um, and at least all of the trust that I've worked with over the years, mm -hmm. uh, they the, the interests from the corpus of the trust are paid out to the certificate holders in one of two ways. They are paid out as, for instance, a stipend. We all know, like, you know, we see it in television shows, you know, the wealthy guy is getting whatever he's getting per month from the trust, right? right. <clears throat> um, and then the other way is that the entire corpus is liquidated and the trust exists no more because it's reached its termination date that's written in the indenture. And at that point, 100% of the assets of the trust are dispensed. And in every competent indenture I've read, it literally says that, that at that time, the trust is dissolved. Okay. Very good. Thank you. So- By the way, uh, what, what, one thing, going, going sure. back to this thing where somebody may say, you know, ah, never mind that whole trust thing. Just give me my stuff back. <laughs> right. um, be, that's fine with a, revo with a revocable trust. They, they can- and literally say there's nothing wrong with it. And the trustee goes, okay, here's your stuff. Okay. Impermissible. That's the key word with an irrevocable trust. It is impermissible. So this is a reason why I think it's important for people to think this through mm -hmm. before they create a trust and stick their property in it. Yeah. Um, you know, for instance, one might think twice about putting their home in trust if they had a rocky marriage. Okay, there's gotcha. there are some issues there. Okay, um, especially in you know a, a state where both parties share interest in real property and things like that. So again, this should be something that that is, if it's going to be an irrevocable trust, it's like getting a tattoo. Better be sh you better be sure you want that on your body for the rest of your life. I'm gonna be committed to it. So let's yes. let's back up. That's a really important point, Dave, that you make. So let's say you got a, a, a an irrevocable trust and you bought land and built a new home, right? Mm -hmm. uh, prior to getting married, let's say that you did it before you met your eventual spouse. What in a situation like that, would that still be, would it's in the trust name, but you bought it prior to being married. Does that have any pliability there? No matter whether... <clears throat> The uh, we're going to use we'll use the term husband. Okay, mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> no matter whether the husband purchased it before the marriage, or the trust purchased it before the marriage, or the husband purchased it and moved it into trust before the marriage, um, <clears throat> in every state family law statutes that I've read, that's called sole and separate property because it was acquired before the marriage. Okay, so the wife would have no claim on that sole and separate property pre-marriage. So that makes a difference. It does, yes. It, that's what I was getting but, at, yeah. Yes, now, if, if it was a man and a wife, they're married, they buy a piece of land, they right. build a home, they put it into trust. Right. And then an irrevocable trust, and then they divorce, bring that's on the right. fleet of attorneys because it's going to get ugly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, right. That's why I was leaning that I was understanding. That's why I was going back to the if you were single, bought land, built, then meet your right person, then marry them. What kind of, you know, leeway or recourse do you have? And you've you've laid that out. So that's because I'm sure some people will be able to relate to that on this podcast very well. 
Um, three more questions for you that I think are a good way to end the podcast and are very important, Dave. Uh, the first one being is, what experts would you recommend to learn from about common law trusts? You see me laughing? I don't know, yeah. I don't know if yeah, the picture course. is clear enough. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Nobody, because the experts aren't teaching it. Hmm. Like I said, there's a handful of people that I would consider experts, and none of them are teaching this subject matter. I actually had somebody reach out to me the other day and ask me for a book that would educate him on common law trusts. And my advice back to him was, I know of no currently published books. However, you may be able to find something in a seriously major law, law library like at a major university that has a huge law program mm -hmm. and they have a law library. I said, you, they may have books on, again, back then it would have just been called trusts. They may have literally books on trusts that are two, 250 years old downstairs in the environmentally controlled sub levels that they could bring up and that you could read in the library, but not remove the book because that's how they do it with those really, really antiquated books, right? Mm -hmm. um, and that was that was my advice. If if you live someplace in a major city where they have a university with a major law program, you might be able to find a book written by, as an example, the men of the era of the founding fathers. But so, there's nothing nothing current because the establishment hates these, absolutely loathes them. Right. So there's there's no media on them out there at this time so then the follow and that's a shame oh, of course so the follow-up question dave maybe i think is appropriate to this question is you said there there if i heard you right there's a few that you consider to be subject matter experts but they're not teaching on it why i'm not sure i have the answer but i'll speculate sure um, if if i may i'll use myself as an example okay um I am busier than a one-legged man in an ass-kicking contest. Okay. Just my normal work. And we're, we're on show two concerning common law trust. And there's still so many permutations. They might be minor, but there's so many permutations. We could do show after show after show and not hit all the permutations and how you apply this principle to that particular equation. <sighs> I think the men who have the expertise don't have the time. I think it's just as simple as that. But I, I suppose anybody can make the time. Okay, so uh, this is a, I'm going to use a silly example. I'm going to use myself so I'm not impugning the integrity of anybody else. Okay. If somebody were to say, look, I want to put a class together with 100 people at a big conference hall in Vegas, and I'm gonna pay you $10,000 to stand there for two days and teach common law trust law. Okay, for 10 grand, I could probably bust that time free. But that's typically not the way it's approached. Um, you get people contacting you onesies and twosies. You know, hey, can you teach me about trust law? Not with what you can afford to pay and not with the, my limited time, no. And I just lost your audio. Oh, I'm sorry. Sorry, I had you muted, so I I wouldn't interrupt you. I wanted everybody to hear what you had to say. Um, can you hear me now? Is that better? Yes, perfect. Okay, so thank you for that. Uh, so let's pivot to the next point. If we can't isolate a particular individual, what organization or organizations might you recommend for someone who's looking to create a common law trust? Organizations to do what? To create a to create a common law trust, I think we tackled this a little bit in the previous show on common law trust. Um, there is only one person of whom I am aware. Okay? I'm not mm -hmm. saying he's the only guy in the country. Right. Um, there is only one person that I trust and that I know is putting out, I've referred to quality trusts and professional trusts a couple of times during this show. Mm -hmm. um, there's only one person that I know in the whole country and 
Um, interesting. Even before you had me on the first time, I had people reaching out to me and asking me to review Trust Indentures. And then after I was on your show, I had more people reaching out and asking me to re review Indentures. Sure. Um, and, and John, it, it has been a disheartening experience. Um, uh, the very best indenture I was asked to review, I would classify as mediocre. Okay. Um, and uh, I readily admit in certain areas, I'm kind of a perfectionist. A lot of things I just blow off. But in certain areas, you got to be a perfectionist, in my opinion. Right. And when you're putting your homes and your other forms of significant property, things that really matter in life, um, and especially if it's an irrevocable trust, oh, it's a done deal here, okay? This can't be un unwound, okay? In my opinion, people can make their own decisions. Um, it better be a quality indenture and it better have a trustee that meets the standards that we talked about earlier in the show. That's just me. Um, sure. So it's, it's, I can't give you a list because again, I talked about this, this isn't a thing in modern society. I mean, corporations are a thing, right? Every time Dick and Harry, they're like, oh, well, I want to start a uh, pet grooming service. I better get an LLC, right? <laughs> um, so corporations are ubiquitous. And trust, common law trusts in particular are the opposite of ubiquitous. They're incredibly rare. Um, and I'll tell you what the landscape looks like to me. And people can disagree with me, but this is my view of the landscape. There's one person that I know who's doing a bang-up job that I would recommend to a close friend okay? and just did, as a matter of fact, about 10 days ago. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's a bunch of people that are somewhere between not competent and shysters. Mm. Um, and I'm not necessarily sure where that line is. Um, you know, who is it who's just not competent and who is it who's just trying to get your money and they don't really know what they're doing and they, the indentures are crap, but Hey, they got your money. So that, that's the, 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 the large part of the landscape. Right. And then there's this one, in my view, then there's this one bright and shining thing on the Hill. So right. I know that doesn't sound the word I'm looking for. That's not a, that's not a rosy picture, but that's the picture I see. And I'm sharing it with you. No, oh, man, that's why I asked you. So and, and this is me thinking out loud. This, this is so much a question, Dave, before the last question, but it's just a commentary to, you know, we talked about in the very beginning, you know, do you need a will if you have a common law trust? And you were very adamantly, no, you know, it's, you can do it, but you don't need it. But I've been thinking that having, going back to the irrevocable versus revocable dichotomy, if you will, right? It, it seems to me, I, correct me if I'm wrong, you're, you're far more knowledgeable and that's why you're here among many reasons, but it seems to me that then you run into morality issues for people like myself of faith of who don't want to, uh, you know, they really love the person they're going to marry, for example, right? They don't want to sign a prenup because that can create some, you know, conflict, some uh, perceptions, you know, perceptions, trust. It's like trust within a trust, so to speak, emotional versus the, you know, physical uh, aspect of a trust. So it seems like, you know, going the route of if, if you're able to, if from a timing perspective, you know, getting an irrevocable trust, if you haven't met your soulmate, your ideal person in putting that in, in putting that home in the irrevocable trust would alleviate the issue of having to get a, even worry about dealing with a prenup because you haven't met that person yet, or you're not in process of marriage. It, it somewhat indemnifies you from that issue. Does that kind of make sense? Absolutely. And uh... You know, it's, I think the, the perfect answer, if that's ever questioned by the future betrothed, is mm -hmm. I didn't know if I'd ever meet you. I was living Man. my life. I put my assets into trust. I didn't know that the day would ever come that I met you. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> or, or when, you know. The, yeah. The, the yeah or when, right, right. Just avoids the moral potentiality of moral turpitude and awkwardness, to say the least. It does. And, you know, emotions are powerful things. And. Sometimes they 
carry more weight than perhaps the actual circumstance does. Right. The, res- the emotional response to the circumstance is greater than the circumstance itself. Yeah, yeah, it's an, over- an overreach, so to speak. Um, yeah, thank you. I, so I'm glad you clarified that. So last question would be, and, and we did touch on this on the, this is a key one, Dave. We touched on this on the first part one of, the, of this discussion, as you mentioned earlier, and another question. Um, but I had some questions. I've been sitting there mulling it over because I wasn't really sure that I understood it. And I imagine if I've had that question, you know, maybe others would as well. But you said something, and, and again, I'm going to paraphrase, and I know you will, you will say it verbatim, but you were talking about the discussion of when you go to the bank, once you have your trust to set up an account, uh, you know, you said that you were trying to subvert using your social security number, using, an, you know, versus an EIN, and that you were eventually you were working with them in, co- in concert to, you know, call back and, and take that out of the paperwork. Um, can you talk about that a little bit about what is the best way to go for someone who does not want to, you know, use a social or an EIN or, or just, just have that account without as much governmental oversight or interference as possible? Do you know what I'm asking? I do. Okay. So I'd like to begin answering by telling you a story that occurred in the late 90s when I was sitting as trustee for literally hundreds and hundreds of trusts. And the Treasury Department decided to make war on common law trust bank accounts. Um, This is not an isolated thing. They did it nationally. And it started at one particular point. And suddenly I started getting calls from managing agents saying, hey, I just got a letter from the bank. They said that I need to provide the the trust needs to provide an EIN or they're shutting it down in 30 days. And then just like the snowball rolling down the hill, more phone calls, more phone calls, more phone calls. And the whole dynamic just continued to grow. And this was the Treasury Department contacting senior counsel at every single major bank in America. (laughs) And saying, these common law trusts, you've opened without taxpayer identification numbers, shut them down. Okay. And basically, Treasury's message was, or the regulators can have an issue with you, <laughs> or you can play ball and shut these accounts down. Um, and of course, we were talking about you know, an infinitesimally small number of accounts nationwide in terms of the total number of bank accounts, right? It was probably like one ten thousandth of 1% because again, common law trusts are not a thing in America anymore, right? But for me, sitting as I think at the time about sitting as trustee for about 600 trusts, um, suddenly there was a tidal wave of all these accounts being, uh, over a period of about 10, 10 to 12 months, um, all these accounts needed to provide an EIN or be closed down. So I, I share that story to make this point. Mm-hmm. Today, I, I am unaware of any financial institution that will open any account for any kind of entity at all without a taxpayer identification number. They wrongly believe that that is part of their duty under the law. But of course, just like you and I have talked about concerning income tax, I've literally said, okay, so that you, you believe you have to have a taxpayer identification number, it's in the law. Show me where in banking law, U.S. banking law passed by Congress, where you have to have a taxpayer identification number to open an account. And then they say, there's the door. <laughs> Instead of providing the law, they say, there's the door. Okay. Mm. Um, I call it the doctrine of missing parts. When you ask them to show the missing parts, they get angry. Okay. They claim there's these parts. Then you say, great, show them to me. They get angry. Um, so at this moment in time, I know one person in the entire country who can open a bank account for a trust engaged in business without an EIN. Hmm. And I don't know the details, but my understanding is it's based on a long-term trusted relationship between the financial institution and the individual. Interesting. It's going to be interesting, Dave, as a footnote to this discussion, to your point, because everything in life, as you well know, is timing. You know, I know that as a musician and it's just everything's timing. Um, Because I say that because, well, it's a universal axiom. But in this context, as you may may or I imagine you may or may not be aware, uh, we'll see. uh, Yesterday, 
uh, October 1st was the first day of the new physical calendar uh, for the West, for the Western world, US and Europe, right? And also uh, Basel III, I don't know if you're familiar with that, but Basel III just took effect in all the banks where they have to have transparency about how much gold and silver in their balance sheets. They can't just, you know, paper down gold and silver anymore and do funny money and all this stuff it really clamps down tight, particularly on tier one banks. So it'll be interesting to see with that in mind, how banks function. Uh, can, I, can I interrupt and ask a question? Sure. These, these Basel three reports, mm -hmm. um, will they be a matter of public record? They will. Okay. Yes, good I question. Because some, no. sometimes they can they send it to the regulators and we, the public, would never see them. No, no, that's a great, uh, that's, I'm glad you brought that up. Thank you. Yeah, because they, in, well, in the past, they didn't have to disclose this stuff, right? They could just paper it down and print funny money and cook the books. But now they're they're going to have to, uh, to publicly disclose. So yeah, no, that's a great point that you make. Yes, yes, they will. So with that in mind, to your accurate point, it'll be interesting to see how financial institutions operate in general, and as, as it equates to these trusts going forward, it'll be just an interesting case study. We'll have to wait and see. So, Oh, yes, yes. You know Very I mean? exciting time. That's why I brought it yeah. up, because I think, I think this discussion is important, obviously, but it's also timely, given what we just discussed. You know, People might be now have an opportunity to get into something really good with an advantageous environment that they might not have previously had, and that's what we're kind of praying for. So we'll, we'll have to see. But... Uh, Dave, it's always a pleasure to have you, brother. We really, really appreciate your invaluable knowledge. Um, how can people, uh, we'll put it in the in the uh, description, but how can people find your work and can they consult with you if they would like to? Uh, they can reach me anytime at my email address, which is dave at drreality.news. And Dr. Reality is drreality.news. Um, also, if they want to purchase a copy of Income Tax Shattering the Mist, Body Science, the Payroll Withholding Handbook, or the W9-1099 Handbook, um, these are for people who know the truth of the income tax and want those resources to help them talk to the companies with whom they're doing business um, and present the information. Some people are not terribly articulate or they might get emotionally worked up. So these handbooks help them do that. Um, they can simply go to drreality.news. Yep. And you can see behind Dave's left shoulder is his income tax book and to the right body science says you need a visual matrix for that. He's thoughtfully put that together. So uh, Dave Champin, always a pleasure to have you. Good sir. We look forward to having you again on the podcast. Thank you for your time and pray you have a, a blessed rest of your day. Thanks, buddy. Take, Take care. care. Take care.